Welcome back to the University of Oxford for week three of Project Phobocam, an ambitious attempt to design a camera which one day could select the first landing site on the moons of Mars. Last week, I designed a system called the desiccator, which will remove the water present in samples of clay in order to create simulated Phobos surface regolith, which we need for the experiment to design this camera. At the moment, all of the components have been ordered and hopefully they'll arrive later in the week, but the heating element, the central component, has already arrived and is in storage. Meanwhile, I'm going to be investigating and studying the thermal environment of Phobos via computer modelling. The thermal environment basically means what the temperature is like on the surface of Phobos as a function of time. So let's talk a little briefly about the key parameters which drive this. The most important parameter to determine the thermal environment is something called the thermal inertia, which is defined, it's given the letter I, as the square root of the thermal conductivity, denoted by kappa, times by the density of the material, which is given the symbol rho, times by the specific heat capacity, given the symbol C. Now, what the reason why this quantity is important is because whether it's small or whether it's large determines the temperature variations we see at the surface. So if the thermal inertia is really, really low, then as a function of time, the temperature will look something like this. Where this is midday, or approximately around midday, sometimes there's a slight delay in the heating. So basically, this here is the day, and this here is the night. So the temperature varies a lot. However, if the firm inertia is really, really high, so this is the case of low firm inertia, in the case of high thermal inertia, the temperature hardly varies at all. It's pretty much flat. So this is the case of high thermal inertia. And so what we want to do is understand on Phobos what typical values could we expect for the thermal inertia because how much the temperature varies will determine what kind of measurements we can do, our signal to noise ratio for our instrument, and ultimately when the best time to do observations are. So we need to know what these free quantities are. So what I've been doing is I've been looking up various papers, in particular ones from the Viking era, Viking 1 and Viking 2 measurements of some of these parameters. And there's also been some papers um, published by people who are working on the Phobos Grunt sample return mission, which unfortunately didn't manage to take off successfully. And so my plan at the moment is to fix the specific heat capacity based on these measurements at around 756 joules per kilogram Kelvin and also to fix the thermal conductivity here at a value of around 7.56 times by 10 to the minus 4, and that's uh, watts per meter Kelvin. And the idea is that the firm inertia will then be entirely specified by the density. And because we don't know what Phobos is made of, we could put in, say, the density of the moon's regolith, we could put in the density of asteroids, for example, and then we can use that in order to get an idea on what this firm inertia is and therefore what the temperature curves are like. So now let's take a look at what some of these curves actually look like when we feed them into a computer model. It's a one-dimensional thermal diffusion model um, written in the 1990s by John Spencer. And let's take a look at some of the results of the model. And here, as you can see on this plot, the temperature profile at the surface of Phobos based on this initial simulation seems to vary up to around 300 Kelvin, which is just slightly above freezing, all the way down to 130 Kelvin during the night. So we've got a huge range of temperature, approximately a difference of 200 Kelvin between the day and night. Um, and this is just due to the fact that the firm inertia of Phobos is extremely low. The roads are a little icy this morning, so I've decided to work from home instead of going into the lab. And in particular, I've been reading up on the scientific literature surrounding Phobos and Phobos sample return missions in order to improve my background knowledge about it, and in particular about the geology and the chemistry of some of the materials we might see on Phobos. So here is a brief selection of some of the papers I've been looking at. 
It's day 13 and today I've been looking a little more into the thermal modelling of Phobos. In particular, as you can see here, I've been working on generating the day-night temperature cycles for a number of different potential materials that we could see on Phobos. The first one, with the huge variation you see there, is the very fine-grained regolith, stuff similar to the clay that I've been preparing down in the lab. That has a very low thermal inertia and hence it changes dramatically during the day. But contrast that to things such as gravel and basalt, these two curves which are very similar which I've got there, which don't really vary that much during the day-night cycle. Um, now, the reason why I'm doing this, why it's interesting, is because the Phobos camera on board the orbiter for our sample return mission is going to be capable of doing two things. Firstly, which is what's related to this, is that it needs to choose whether the landing site is going to be on an area of very finely grained material or an area with more rocky material in order to choose the sample that can best meet the scientific goals. So if it sees a big variation curve like this in a certain area, it knows that it's finely grained. And if it sees an area with not much variation, it knows it's a more rocky area. And then it will be up to the scientists back on Earth to decide which one of those potential scenarios is more interesting to land and collect a sample. So this is the first thing the camera is going to be capable of doing. The second thing, which is what I'm going to be working on with experiments in the moon box, which requires my samples from the desiccator, which will be done over the next few weeks or so, is about determining the composition of the landing sites. So you do this in order to choose finely grained versus rocky boulders. And then the next step will be to work out whether you want to get, say, I don't know, olivine or pyroxene or all the different other types of minerals that are there. So that's what's coming up next. Hey, Ryan. Oh, hey, Jesse. Can you break down some olivine for me? Oh, uh, sure. What do you need it for? Well, you know our moon box, yeah. right? And so what's special about the moon box is we can simulate the temperatures and pressures on the moon, which are both way lower than the Earth. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that um, the spectra we get out of the moon box versus Earth atmosphere are very different. Yeah. And so me and another one of the postdocs are currently working on a model to try and simulate these spectra. So we need some... Ah, okay, um, so what, what, what size do you need it? Um, so we want to look at different sizes because part of what we want to look at is how the spectrum changes with size. Okay. The moon box versus Earth pressure. Right, and um, olivine is obviously quite common, so there should be some olivine on Phobos potentially. So right. can I use some of it for my project as well? Of course. <laughs> oh, excellent. Well, okay, time to go down to the lab and smash up some rocks then. Well, hey! <laughs> Have fun! <laughs> So it looks like in the second half of this week, I'm going to be breaking down and destroying some of these lovely gemstones of olivine. But in the meantime, it's halfway through the week, and it means it's time for our weekly scientist feature. My name is Niraj Walikalo. I'm a uh, postdoctoral uh, research assistant here in the Department of Physics at Oxford. And I work on uh, uh, two aspects that relate, both related to galaxies and cosmology. Uh, the first is on probing um, the formation of stars in, in galaxies. And I work on, I'm very interested in uh, very distant galaxies, galaxies that formed relatively early on in cosmological time. And I'm applying novel methods on images of these galaxies to look at the distribution of, of star formation within them. Uh, the other aspect of my research uh, also uses galaxies, but to answer a very different question which is uh, how do we, um, how can we constrain the dark sector of the universe? Um, now, most of the stuff in the universe is dark. Uh, it's dark matter, um, and we, we uh, of which we know very little, in fact. Uh, and most of the energy in the universe is tied up with dark energy, which is responsible for driving the cosmic acceleration of the universe. And I study uh, both of these um, using a very powerful probe called uh, gravitational lensing, which is the deflection of light from very di uh, distant background galaxies uh, by the, the dark matter in the foreground, which is between those galaxies and, the, and, and us, the, the observers, and our telescopes. Uh, so I use the deflection of, of light, um, and it's a weak signal, uh, and it causes a, a distortion in the shapes of those background galaxies. And uh, in Oxford, we are very active at uh, making this measurement of these shape distortions. And it's a powerful probe because 
um, if it's averaged over billions of galaxies, we can estimate the dark matter, the mass distribution of dark matter in the universe. Um, so it provides us essentially a map of, of the three-dimensional map of the dark matter in the universe. And at the same time, because structure, uh, the rate at which structure forms depends on uh, or is tied into the, the expansion history of the universe, at the same time we have a powerful constraint on, on dark energies. It's day 14 and yesterday some of the postdocs upstairs heard that I was still waiting for the various components of the desiccator to actually arrive, so they gave me some olivine to break down. Now, the reason why they're interested in that is because they're working on a computer program to predict how the spectrum of olivine changes as a function of particle size. But in order to test whether their program is working or not, they require some actual laboratory data from physically breaking down the samples and getting the spectra. So that's what I've decided to be working on. And this is actually useful for me because olivine, and particularly magnesium-rich olivine, has been found on the Moon, asteroids, Mars, and even even a few very primitive um, solar system meteorites, so potentially it could be a quite common mineral on Phobos. Now, the problem with olivine, like this that you can see here, is effectively, it's effectively a gemstone. It's not going to be like the clay, which was relatively easy and quick to break down. In fact, the way we quantify how easy it is to break down a certain material or mineral is by something called the Mohs hardness scale where, for example, 10 on the hardness scale would be a diamond. And the higher the number is, the much harder it is to break down, and anything with a higher number can scratch something with a lower number. So the clay that I was working on was 2 on the Mohs hardness scale, but this olivine is 7. So it's going to be quite a challenge, but, well, let's get started. First step is to clean some of the olivine. We're going to cleanse it, to make it pretty. Put in the fire. Call him, call him. My own, my stone, my precious. Okay, now it's time to sort the olivine according to its purity, because we want to remove any of the olivine that has some uh, basalt contamination it. So, let's get sorting. The olivine needs to be sorted according to its purity, because we only want pure samples of olivine going into our scientific experiments. But the problem is that a lot of the olivine that we have is contaminated by basalt. So what I need to do is look very closely using these little magnifying lenses that I have on this headset in order to look for tiny little black specks of basalt, like what you can see in this collection of um, olivine just over here. And first step will be to remove any that contain the basalt, and then later on I can then be much more strict with the olivine samples that remain in order to ensure that only the very purest remain. It's day 15, the end of week 3, and pretty much I've been spending the last week waiting for the components to build the desk to arrive, and they haven't, which is uh, very frustrating when we submitted the order last week. So today I went and chased it up to see what was happening, and it looks like it kind of got lost on a desk or something, and then it got buried in paperwork. But the order has been submitted, it got submitted yesterday, which means that actually, in fact, just like 10 minutes ago, just before I was about to uh, leave at the end of the week, I received an email saying that the components, or at least all of them apart from the acrylic box, have arrived and are now in storage, and I'll be able to collect them on Monday because storage has unfortunately closed now, but next week, definitely, we can begin on the desiccator construction. Which is good, but, you know, this is how it works in science. Occasionally there's delays and you have to work on other things. And speaking of working on other things, I've been taking a look and focusing on the preparation of the olivine samples today, and I'm really quite pleased. I've got almost about 15 grams of very, very pure crystals prepared. The kind that if they were washed and prepared by a professional jeweler, you might see in jewellery, for example. So let's take a look at some of them. I've sorted the olivine into three piles, the pure, the weathered, and the basaltic olivine. Let's take a look at each of them in turn. This is the pure olivine, these lovely little gemstones, which I'm going to be breaking down into a fine, almost crystalline powder, which will then be used for our scientific experiments. 
This, however, is the Wesodolvian. Though it doesn't contain any basalt contaminants, the problem is it's very cloudy, it's not transparent like we want for our pure samples of olivine, so there might be some kind of internal contaminants and complex chemistry going on inside of it that means that we can't guarantee whether the spectra will be right. And finally, this is the basaltic contaminated olivine. You can see these little black spots of basalt and in some cases just mud and general junk. Not at all what we want for our science. The only thing that would really make this even more impressive is if it had some kind of red LED or something just going... Ah well, it's, it's quite cool. I, I've quite enjoyed um, being a almost jeweler for a day or two uh, preparing the olivine samples. So, so that's certainly fun. But next week... Finally, the construction of the desiccator begins, and the great thing is that once the samples are prepared, the actual measurements of the samples under simulated phobus conditions won't take that long, so the project is still on track despite this delay, and I'm certainly excited. So, well, let's continue with the project then! Thanks for watching! After a long wait this week, finally the components for the desiccator have arrived, and construction will begin next week. Or in the words of my supervisor, Oh no, we've given Ryan the ability to create fire. Well, I hope you'll stick around to see it, and until next time, I'll see you then on Project Phobocam.